thank you everyone for your attendance here. Uh, when I first envisioned this talk, I was hoping to accomplish the following. Make this interesting, engaging, and informative. Uh, but what happened when I submitted the, uh, my, my blurb about what this was going to be, Lois got a hold of it, and she added fun to the whole thing. So uh, I've got a very tall order here that I thought, and rather than fight Lois, because I seem to get along with her, other than she signs me up for things that I am not sure I really want to, but uh, I, I certainly will give this a try. But I want you to keep in mind this quote from Teddy Roosevelt here, because this is stats we're talking about and got to make it fun. So who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who need no neither victory nor defeat. So regardless of what happens here tonight, Teddy Roosevelt and I, I think we would be best of friends. And in that line, have some fun. We talked about uh, conspiracy theories and we've talked about all the damage they do. So part of my little blurb here at the beginning, I want to promote my own conspiracy theory here. I think there is a global cabal consisting of casino owners, big data providers, including Google, Amazon, et cetera, teachers and professors of probability and statistics, and those that know something about stats and refuse to move on until they go, they take you all the way down the rabbit hole with them. And then there's those who arrogantly and condescendingly push the idea that there is a single answer to the Monty Hall problem. So this cabal, it makes it unnecessarily difficult to learn uh, for the general population to understand probability and statistics. So if you've taken a probability and stats course, and you couldn't see how it applied to your life or you glazed over with boredom or it seemed way too complicated so that you couldn't follow what was going on. I want you to know that it's not your fault. Powerful forces were aligned against you. So this, I'm hoping, or I wish this was the first class of the first probability and statistics course I was ever given. Now, we don't have a lot of great communicators in probability and statistics, but we do have some good science communicators. And if you look up this uh, podcast, this video that's on YouTube, Neil deGrasse Tyson explains the need to know information. And in this, he's talking about, and he knows you know, the orbits of the planets. He says he starts off by just saying, the earth orbits in a circle around the sun. He says, everyone knows it's elliptical, but, but when we say it's elliptical, uh, we, when, trying to, yeah, when we try and draw it, we exaggerate the ellipse such that we would be more wrong trying to draw the ellipse showing that we know that it's supposed to be ellipse than we would have been if we just stuck with a circle. And he says, even if you get the ellipse right, it's not entirely correct because the earth and the, the moon orbit each other. So they both perturb each other. So there's a little bit of a, a wiggle that goes on in the ellipse. And then the ellipse doesn't repeat the same path year after year. There's a procession around the sun. So he says, start with the basics and build up your knowledge as you go. So this stats course is the, the equivalent of saying the orbits are round. And one last caveat before we start, we're playing with the tools. So I want you to think along the lines of when you had your first iPad or a new car or a, a new tool, a new appliance, you probably played with it until, so you could understand what it can do, how it does it, and how you can make it do those things. You played around to learn about it. And you played around before you use it to do serious stuff. I'd like you to keep that in mind. We're going to play around with the stats tools to give you an idea of how they work and what they can do. This means I'm not necessarily going to be demonstrating best practices. So I will point that out afterwards, uh, but I'm promising you I'm not misleading you. So just be curious and uh, understand I'm trying to convey, uh, I am trying to convey understanding here, not just knowledge, not a bunch of facts that you don't know what to do with. I want you to come away with this with a visceral understanding in your gut, what, the, what your gut tells you about probability 
versus what the math tells you. So start off, we're gonna do some deductive reasoning. First thing, central to probability and statistics is understanding the range of possible outcomes and the relative likelihood of those individual outcomes occurring. So in order to build up this understanding, we're gonna go through a, we're going to build up this understanding. We're gonna construct several probability distributions using just regular dice, okay? Now these are dollar store dice. So if you were super skeptical and we might have those people in this group, uh, and you want to point out that these would not be allowed to be used in Vegas, we can talk afterwards about redoing this work to satisfy your concerns. But I'm asking that you accept them as good enough for the purposes here. So dice, sorry if I'm getting too basic to start here. It's going to ramp up pretty quick. So each die has six sides. Each side has a different number of pips on it, one through six inclusive. Assuming the die is fair, if you shake it up and toss it, the, and toss the die, you can't control the outcome and each of the six sides is equally likely to come up. If I put it in a chart, it would be boring, but it would look like this. So it could be one, one chance of it being one, two, one chance of it being two. Tables are boring, I know, but if I present it in a bar chart, it's only slightly less boring. But if you roll two dice at once, now it starts to get more interesting because we're talking about two dice and two dimensions on your screen, we can make a chart that looks like this. So die one can be anywhere from one to six. Die two can be anywhere from one to six. Uh, so we have 36 possible outcomes. But because we add the pips, the outcomes, so we have 36 possible results. But because we add up the, the numbers, the outcome is the sum. The outcome can only be between two and 12 or 11 possible outcomes. So we have more results than we do have outcomes. So for example, there's only one way you can roll a two. Die one has to be one, die two has to be one. But to get a, a three, die one can be two and die two can be one or die one can be one and die two can be two. There's two ways for it to become three. And it doesn't even have to be the, your mirror image of the same number to get seven. You can have six and one, five and two, four and three and the mirror image of it. So it's not equally likely the outcomes. And if we did our probability distribution curve, we get this, 36 outcomes, or 36 results, 11 outcomes. There's only one way for it to be two, but there's six ways for it to be seven. So the outcomes are not equally distributed. Results versus outcomes. I'm just using this terminology for this dice portion of the, the presentation. So there's more results than outcomes. Each result is equally likely to occur but several results may map onto one outcome and outcomes are not equally likely to occur. So build this up. I need to stop sharing here for a moment. Share screen again. All right, so our, our, our chart or our table for three dice starts to get pretty big because we don't have that many dimensions to show on the screen. But I just wanna walk you through what I'm doing. I'm doing basically a count. Die one, die two, die three is one outcome, and there's a total. So I'm just making the, the, the spreadsheet counted up. One, 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 two, one, one, three, and then it goes to six, one, two, one, and it just goes. So there are a lot, 216 different results for the, for, uh, for rolling three dice. But if you wanted to see the, the total number of results that map to an individual outcome, I've just got the spreadsheet to count them up here. So for seven, we've got one, two, 
three, there's a total of 15 all the way down. So if I jump ahead of it, there's our probability distribution for three dice. 216 results, 16 outcomes. We jump to four, 1,296 results, 21 outcomes. Five, we're getting to big numbers, 7,760, uh, 76 results, 26 outcomes, and I'll stop at six. So that's 46,656 results, only 31 outcomes. So six dice, the lowest number can be a six, and there's only one way that can happen. But you go up to 21, the most popular one, there's 4,332 ways you can get a 21. All right, we just built up, we just built up a probability distribution for uh, six dice, All right? Let's jump, uh, let's jump in and test whether this model actually does match reality. So this is the same spreadsheet from the last couple pages there. I have selected different outcomes just at the thin end of the tails here. So from six through 13 inclusive, and then at the end, uh, 30 through 36 inclusive. So I've selected 15 out of 31 outcomes, but because those are the small ones, those are at the outside, that's half the outcome, half the possible outcomes should only represent about 5% of the observed outcomes. So if I roll the dice 20 times, we should get 19, should be between 14 and 29 inclusive, and only one should be 13 or less, or 31 or more. We'll do a second test at the same time. Same sort of thing, I'm just selecting the six, the six uh, outcomes in the middle, the most popular ones. So only six outcomes, that's 19% of the total possible outcomes, but it should represent almost half of the observed outcomes. So I'm gonna ask your patience for five or six minutes here, but I think it's important to actually see the real life results of how does this work in real life. And for that, I'm gonna see if I can uh, pin, this is my, this is my cell phone that's pointed at uh, the table here. I'm gonna roll the dice, six dice, count the pips. We're gonna do it 20 times and we're gonna see just how well our model fits the, the how well our model fits observed reality. So test one, we're expecting just one, one time about that it will be six to 13 or 30 to 36. And 19 times should be between 14 and 29 inclusive. Second test, it should be 50-50 between 18 and 23, or six to 17, or 24 to 36. So roll dice and 10, 22, okay. And let's see if I can pick up the pace. Uh, 10, 15, 17. Okay. Well, wow. we have 10, 20, 26. Yeah. Okay, 10, 15, 21, 23, 26, 10, 25, 10, 
8, 10, 15. Yeah. Ooh. 24, 25, 28. So we're seeing test one is sticking to reality so far, but test two is a bit lopsided, but that's okay. 20 isn't a whole lot of samples here. So 10, 5, 10 12, woohoo, there's a 12 and six to 17. Ten, eighteen, nineteen, okay. eighteen, twenty, twenty-three, twenty-six. Good. Eleven, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen. All right, eleven, fourteen, seventeen, twenty, twenty two. Ten, twenty three. Half done. Nine, ten, sixteen, seventeen. So ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty three. In no stats course have I taken has someone actually demonstrated and put their money where their mouth is. So I'm hoping you give me credit for that. 10, 15, 20, 23. 10, 15, 18, 19, 20. More ten, nineteen, twenty, twenty four, last one, ten, fifteen, nineteen, twenty three. Okay, is that right? That is right. Okay, so we thought that when one in 20 would be in this range and then we were right and 19 and 20 would be in this range. We were right. We thought this would be 50-50 and it turned out to be nine to 11, pretty close. So if you know me, you know that I am a little bit anal here. So I am going to remove the pin, share screen again, and let you know that not only did we do it just this once, but I did this, that same stuff, that same roll the dice, count them up 19 times last night. You use a random num number generator, or is it because you had to prove that with those dollar dice, <laughs> okay, that's an excellent question, Donna. So the uh, the random number generator follows the model that we came up with. So it gets to be a circular. Uh, it gets to be a circular argument if I oh, did. I that. Yeah, okay? it's already built in. Okay, I yeah. get it. Like the the random number generator is built off of that model. So the model can't prove itself. <laughs> Got it. 
But that's it's, like it's, saying you know something's true. Something in the Bible is true because the Bible said so. <laughs> right. Excellent. So we've paused right now. Is there any questions with what we've done so far? Okay. I will jump back into the, the presentation here. Uh, thanks for, what am I trying to say? Thank you for coming back. Ooh, that looks good. Okay. Yeah. So let's just have a bit of a debrief on there. I told you I would not be using best practices there. So there's a couple things in there that, uh, that if you caught them, I give you big kudos for finding this. I didn't do anything wrong, but I did some stuff that, that would generate suspicion if I tried to use this to prove something more than the, the, the model seems to be right. What, one thing I did is I used one set of data to prove two different tests. So when I rolled the dice 20 times, that would seem to indicate that my, my results either support or refute the model, but it would seem that you would have twice as much data supporting it or refuting it, supporting it, I would suggest in this case. Uh, but, but there was only one set of data. So it's a little disingenuous there, not offside. It was just a little uh, keep your eye on the peanut sort of idea. The other one is I said, I ran that, uh, that model 19 times last night. And I don't know if that helps prove it, but I, I wrote everything down. Things I could have done there, I could have, um, uh, I, I could have selectively put the, the little tick marks in, in the spots that I uh, wanted to support, that supported the data. I, I could have done, you know, 50 separate uh, runs of that and chosen the best 19. Or I could have arbitrarily stopped at 19 saying that was, you know, we've got the good number at that point. I don't know if we've, we've seen the, uh, if we got cut off before I showed the, the spreadsheet that had the results of all 20 of those, but we are exceptionally close to our uh, predicted numbers after 400 dice rolls. Okay. So. What I did write, I clearly said, here are the ranges of the outcomes that will go under one category or the other. I didn't allow for any uh, ambiguity in that. But one thing I didn't do, and because we're just playing with the toys, is I did not say, here's the criteria where we will accept that model or we will reject that model. So there's a handful of things there that, you know, uh, not best practices. So let's take a break from the math and talk about something a little more in English. So one of the, as what we did there for an example, when we added more dice is something that's called regression to the mean. And regression to the mean simply means that the more items you have, here's three dice, this is six dice, the more items you have that are randomly uh, variable about a central point, the more likely the, the larger number is going to be closer to the mean. So as an example, three dice, the high number is 18, three sixes. There is one way to get 18, out of 216 possible results. But if we use six dice, the high one is, and it hardly shows up here on the, on the screen, is 36. And there's only one way to get that out of 46,656 possible results. So it is far more likely that you are going to have something closer to the mean when you have more, or if you have fewer, you are more likely to see uh, collectively, that uh, a smaller number is going to be an outlier. Now, a real-world example of that, class size. Uh, I read the, the Atlantic magazine, and this seems to be something that comes up a few times 
every year or so. And it seems to be taken as a given that smaller class sizes lead to better outcomes, but there isn't a whole lot of evidence to support that. And I don't wanna be jumping into this debate thinking I know everything or this is the final answer. There's very good reasons to believe this. However, if we have this hypothetical small, cli uh, small class size argument, if someone gave you this argument, uh, and the hypothetical argument is, if you look at all the classes that are collectively a full grade point above the average for the province or state, smaller class sizes are overrepresented in those results. Their conclusion, therefore smaller class sizes lead to better student outcomes. Now, what you know about uh, regression to the mean here is you should ask the question, uh, this evidence by itself, you shouldn't just accept the, based on this premise and this evidence, you shouldn't result at just accept this outcome or this conclusion. You should also ask about all the class sizes that are full grade point below the average. And if those small class sizes are similarly overrepresented in the results of full grade point below the average, that would indicate the class size isn't the critical factor in academic success. So this point was brought up in the Atlantic. I'm sorry, I can't find the, the, the article for that, but uh, I'm just asking you that that is a good question or that's a good question to ask. So a caveat, I don't purport to know anything other than this very narrow issue on what is surely a very broad and deep subject. And I'm not even refuting anything. I'm just saying this is a good question to ask in order to understand what is known about the issue. Separate, uh, another stories. Uh, one of the things I want you to take from this presentation overall is that good data is expensive, but wars provide exceptionally good data opportunities. Soldiers are uh, at a standard level of fitness with a standard level of training using standardized equipment, employing standardized tactics. So they're trying to be the same in all of these things. So that provides uh, a very ripe opportunity to learn about all of those standardized things and how effective they are. Again, in wars like World War II, you have a, a small advantage that has big implications for your side or against the other. So this is a famous example from World War II. Uh, people were gathering data about planes that returned from bombing missions. And these dots indicate where damage was inflicted on the planes during their mission. So uh, once you have enough data, uh, you, uh, you can see that a pattern emerges and it's time to determine the meaning and significance of those patterns. And from that meaning and significance, you can infer, as uh, the significance inferred, you can decide what, if anything, you wish to change. So from this data gathered, initially the meaning inferred was that planes were hit in these areas and planes were not hit in the cockpit, the engines, or this uh, narrow neck of the, the, the fuselage. So the conclusion initially, allegedly, was that these are the spots that we should uh, beef up the structural integrity and the armament on the planes in order to handle where the planes obviously get hit. So give yourself a pat on the back if you question that line of thinking. I have to believe that it either never happened or it didn't last long. But fortunately, a statistician named Abraham Wald glommed onto this and helped to codify our understanding of survivorship bias. He wrote very many articles on this, very influential articles. So Wald saw the very same data and came to the exact opposite conclusions on meaning and recommendation. He said that where the plane got hit was completely random. The damage observed on the planes that made it back to base was proof that planes could be hit in these locations and still function. It was the planes where damage wasn't recorded on the planes that returned to base that shows that those were the spots that when a plane was hit there, the damage would bring the plane down. Therefore, it was the, the locations where the damage wasn't recorded that should be reinforced which makes sense, engine nacelles, cockpit, vulnerable parts of the fuselage. 
What I want you to take from this, my point here in these, those two examples, is that math or data on its own doesn't prove a theory. Math is a way of modeling something. Good models highlight what is important and suppress what isn't important. While the math and the model may be flawless examples of internally consistent logic, if they don't include everything that is important, they can lead your understanding of reality astray. So the more you learn about models and how they work, the more you are likely to be able to understand how things could be leading you astray and ask good questions to see if they, to try and ensure that they don't. Back to the math. This is our probability distribution for that six dice uh, system. Uh, what we did essentially is we took the area under six to 13. So add that all up. If you said it's one Y by how many tall, you can cal calculate an area. Similarly here, if you take the area under that portion of the curve and compare it to or take it as a ratio of the area under the total curve, you could see where the, the probability or the, the distribution or how, uh, how often something is likely to show up. So if we talk, but more generally, we talked not about specific outcomes, but ranges of outcomes. So if we had a generic probability distribution curve, uh, that would be incredibly useful for a lot of things in life. And it turns out that if you use math uh, just a bit more advanced than what we use to develop our uh, dice probability curves, i.e. counting, adding, counting again, we can come up with an actual generic probability distribution. So here's a good point to put a pin in something for your, your knowledge, what you're building up. I gave the Neil deGasse Tyson saying that, you know, start off orbits are circular. And this is the right, the direct analogy to that. Only, only difference is unlike orbits, there are a lot of things that follow this, this distribution perfectly. And okay, this is often recurred, referred to as the bell curve. I want you to know that there are lots of probability distributions. Some of them are minor tweaks to this, some of them are more substantial, uh, and many of them uh, actually look like a bell shape. So this one, it's formally called the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution. And just to make things complicated, just as an aside, uh, normally stuff in stats is named after the person who came up with it. So Gaussian distribution to refer to the guy that came up with this. Uh, when we call this the normal distribution, this is probably the only time in stats where what something is called is actually descriptive of what it does. So I guess our cabal has not made, get, gotten to the normal distribution yet. Let's enjoy that while it lasts. So you have a circle? You probably haven't thought of the formula about that since high school or possibly, right? but all you need to draw a circle is you need the, the center point, in this case, HK, which is minus three, four, and the length of the radius, which in this case is five. So the formula looks complicated, but it comes up with a circle that you know how to, what it looks like. And there's only two things that define it. Similarly, for a normal distribution, this curve only requires two things. One, what is the, the mean, the arithmetic mean, the average? In this case, it's shown as zero and something called the standard deviation. The standard deviation is just a measure of how variable the data is around the mean. But what's significant is with standard deviations, it doesn't matter how big or small a standard deviation is, the same amount of, of data or the same number of outcomes would fall under that portion of the, the standard deviation. Plus or minus one uh, standard deviation from the mean, there would be 34.1% you know, above it, 34.1% below it. And between one and two standard deviations, 13.6%. So if you're, if you take the, you know, a small standard deviation, 
the, this curve is tall and skinny. If you have a large standard deviation, the curve is short and squat. And regardless uh, how big that standard de deviation is, you have, uh, like for an example, if you have a, you're in a machine shop and you're making something to a specified length, a standard deviation might be 0.05 millimeters. But if you're chopping logs by, by eye him, to length by eye and using a chainsaw, you might have a standard deviation of 10 centimeters. So uh, it does not matter how big the standard deviation is, the curve follows this general pattern. And you don't have to stick with uh, even numbers of those standard deviations. So these are typical ones that are pulled out. If you want 90%, you go 1.64 standard deviations above and below the, the mean. 95% that we see a lot of, 1.96 standard deviations above and below. Okay. So let's lose, use some, get into inductive reasoning. And I want to review what we did with deductive reasoning when we developed the probability distribution for dice. Uh, first, we developed a very deep understanding of how the system worked. I know dice are not complicated, but we spent the time to go very deep into that system. We created a model of how that system worked. And then we sampled the results of that system to test that the model conforms to reality. What might blow your mind is we can turn that all on its head. We can sample the results of a system, apply a generic model to that data, and then infer something about the nature of that system or how it works. So for this, I have another, uh, another example of real life data. I don't know if you see my face here, but I've got a beige bag. There are 300 glass marbles. In there. The glass marbles are either clear, like this one, or basically white, like this one. So there's some proportion of marbles in there. Uh, so by sampling just a handful of these marbles, uh, let's see how good of a guess we can get without seeing all of them. In the real world, you often can't get certainty. Uh, this is an example that's different here. You can, uh, we could dump all the marbles out, count them all up, and then we'd know exactly what, how many uh, clear marbles and how many white marbles are in the bag. But often in reality, you can't. It's prohibitively expensive in time or money. Uh, so we're just going to, again, play with the model and see what we can come up with. So, uh, let's see if I want to, pin my, uh, <clears throat> pin my cell phone, looking at this egg carton. So reach in, grab the you, you have to stop sharing first. It doesn't work the way you're doing. What does, okay. Stop sharing. Okay. I would like to have you mostly see my marble spreadsheet here. Does this spreadsheet show up? The spreadsheet shows up, yes. Perfect. If you're doing the other one at the at the same time, it will only show. Uh, okay. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So the spreadsheet is on now. So, uh, let me just yeah get back into this. So, we had our probability distributions from before. This is what you know right now. It, it stands an equal likelihood of being anywhere along this continuum. Basically a third of 1% that it could be, you know, zero clear marbles and 300 white or 300 clear, no whites or anywhere in between. 
Now, I strongly suspect each one of you to be human, and you are faced with an unknown. And many of you have probably started making up stories to fill in for that missing information. It's what we do. The unknown is uncomfortable. And in evolutionary history, unknown wasn't just uncomfortable, it was, a it was dangerous. So we used our considerable brain power to come up with a story that gives us the feeling of control. The stories that our ancestors told themselves that worked on the African savanna got coded into our DNA and live on as instincts uh, and heuristics, and the, along with the resulting biases that each of us is using in our Stone Age brains to navigate the modern world. So definitely keep track of your stories, but science is, in large part, keeping separate in, our, in your mind what you know, what you suspect, and what you are testing without jumping ahead. So again, that is our understanding of what there is right now. Without looking at the flag, grab a handful of marbles. And I've got two, four, six, eight clear, one white. Now if I go back and put that into this information, our probability distribution changes. The only thing you know for sure is that there is at least one white marble and possibly 299 uh, clear marbles, or that there is at least eight, marble, eight clear marbles and 292 white marbles. But you don't think that that's equally distributed between them. Uh, this is the curve that says that, uh, yeah. the average best guess is 267 clear marbles. But if we wanted to be 90, 95% sure, it would probably be between 169 and 294. Let's gather some more information. We're not putting that back yet. Again, one white marble, two, four, six clear. So if we put that in, we have better information. We probably have a better estimate. So the green line is showing our, our probability for the, the new data once we got more information. And this one is two, four, six, eight clear, no whites. Okay. Our, you'll notice that our curves are not just going straight up, getting taller and skinnier as we get better data, they're jumping back and forth about the mean, about, <laughs> about the best guess right now. So let me just quickly do this a couple more times. Ah, three whites and two, four, six clear. The math tells us, ah, so because we, we started shifting there, our, our uh, mean shifted to the left and our certainty went down. We'll call this at the end. Oh, okay. There's three whites and five clears. Oh, let's do it again. Last one. Three whites. Oh, five clears again. Okay. Well, that's a bit of a jumbled mess. But the more information we had, the more we revised our estimate of what this would be. So 
At the end, gathering all of that information, our best guess is there are 233 uh, clear marbles. But if we wanted to be 95% sure, i.e. that we would be right 19 times out of 20, we would pick a range of 192 up to 260, a spread of 68 mar marbles. Okay. So, so this is what our generic probability curve tells us. And if you were saying, if this was, uh, yeah, what am I trying to say? Uh, let's just move on. So let's take an example of how you would make a decision. So often in science, you would have messy data like this, that this is your, your best understanding of what something is going on in, the, in the, the population. And you want to take something else. In that case, I have a similar bag, gray bag of marbles. I'm just going to go reach in, grab a big handful once, and we're going to see what the, uh, the results are. So if we said that we wanted to be uh, let's see, change this, sorry, because of that. So if we think that there's less than 199 marbles, that's our probability distribution to be right. I'm sorry, we want to find out if there are fewer clear marbles in the gray bag. We want to do that. We're going to take one sample and have the test this with the, the null hypothesis. So we've gathered information in the beige bag. We've got the gray bag. It too has 300 marbles. Same thing, clear or white. So is the proportion of clear marbles less in the gray bag than there is in the beige bag? And if we want to be right 19 times out of 20, we accept that we might be wrong 5% of the time or one time out of 20. The way this is commonly set up is to state a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis basically embraces skepticism in the form of saying, whatever I sample from the gray bag, in this case, it is likely to be explained by the natural noise and variability that I saw before and I am familiar with. In this case, that noise and variability from the, the beige bag. So if we say, 199, or that would be two thirds. If I grab a bunch of these, and if they are less than two thirds uh, clear, we will reject the null hypothesis and accept that there are fewer marbles in the gray bag. So I've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 11, and two, four, six, eight, nine. So it is much less than the two thirds. We reject the null hypothesis and we would say that there are fewer marbles in the gray bag. All right. And I will stop presenting here. Move my pen, sorry. Screen share. No. And jump into our inductive reasoning. Okay. Okay. So from the, the beige bag, just gonna quickly go through this. Of course, I sampled that same beige bag a bunch of times. Uh, this is the results of past. So the exact same number of clear versus white marbles in the beige bag, here are past runs. Sorry for the noise on this old one, but one run, two runs, three runs, And that's the last of the runs. So one thing to, I'll give you, 
is that there were 234 clear marbles in the, in the beige bag. And that this last run was right on it. Uh, which there was one run here that just came close. But for the most part, we were always right, or we were always right in our guesses. <sighs> Sorry about this. Okay, last one, last section of the whole thing. And I think I've got a bit of time to, to use. I talked to you about my conspiracy theory about the Monty Hall problem. Um, so let's go briefly over why I say there is a conspiracy here. I find the Monty Hall problem interesting because it's really a human psychology and scientific aptitude test masquerading as a simple math and probability problem. So just give some background. The, the problem was inspired by the game show Let's Make a Deal hosted by Monty Hall. This problem was first posed in 1975 and it was called the Monty Hall program, uh, problem. Monty Hall himself actually got into the debate because there was, this was going all around. And he said, his show, his rules, you choose a door, you're stuck with it. So these rules, the, the rules of the problem don't, uh, uh, do not actually map to how it was done on Let's Make a Deal. So how the Monty Hall problem is normally presented? You suppose that you are on a game show and presented with a choice of three doors. One door has a grand prize, the other two have nothing. You choose a door, say door one. The host opens another door, say door three, and that the host shows that door three has nothing behind it, so the grand prize is not there. Further, some forms of this problem state that the host knows what is behind the doors. And then the host gives you the choice of switching from your initial choice, door one, to the unopened door, door two in this case. The problem is, or the question is, should you switch? So, uh, back when we started off at the sampling from the gray bag or the beige bag, I said that there was, this is what you know, you do not uh, flat distribution. And I suspected that maybe many of you are filling in details to guess what the, uh, where the, the correct answer would be. Uh, and I told you to keep, try and keep clear in your head what you know, what you don't know, what you suspect and what you're testing. And this is a good example of that. Because I say there is not a single answer possible, a single un undeniably correct answer possible based solely on the information you are given. You need to make some assumptions to come up with an answer. And because you are making assumptions, you are not in a position to say you have the answer unless you can sh show that your assumptions are correct. So that's why I said people that, that arrogantly and confidently say that there is one correct answer. Those are part of the cabal. So I find this that's interesting and it's kind of a wasted opportunity. Let me demonstrate by showing three different assumptions about what the host knows, what their motivations are, and what they do with that information. So hypothesis one, rule set A. And I'm saying the host is actually neutral. This is what most people assume when they first presented with the problem. The contestant chooses a door. The host chooses a remaining door at random to be opened. So if the ch host chooses a door with the grand prize, we get the wah wah sound effect and you know that the contestant got nothing. But if, and only if the host chooses a door with nothing, only then do they invite the contestant to switch their choice of doors. That's rule set A, host is neutral. Rule set B, the host helps you. This is how most people say, what most people say is the correct answer. The contestant chooses a door, the host, knowing where the grand prize is, chooses a remaining door that they know has nothing behind it. So under these rules, the round will never be over at this point and it proceeds to the next step. The host invites the contestant to, uh, if they want to switch their choice of doors. Rule set B, the host is helpful. And I have never seen this, Rule set C, the host is working against you. 
this isn't our Monty Hall, this is evil Monty Hall from the Star Trek Mirror Universe. He's here to make sure you don't get the prize and laugh at you while you fail. So, in this, under this rule set, rule set C, the contestant chooses a door, the host, knowing where the grand prize is, chooses the door with the grand prize if it is not the one you have already chosen, if it's not the one the, the contestant has chosen. So if the host chooses the door with the grand prize, like in set A, you get the wah wah sound effect and the contestant loses. I guess in this one, the host actually laughs at you too. But if, and only if the host chooses the door with nothing, only then do they invite the contestant to switch their choice of doors. Okay, all three rule sets, you as the contestant could get to switch your choice of doors. It's possible under all three hypotheses. If given this choice, you will be in a position where you now have more information than when you have made your first choice. That's true across all three things, all three scenarios. But the meaning and significance of that new information varies greatly amongst the rule sets. And so does what you should do. So rule set A, the host is neutral. The only significance of the new information here is that you're still in the game. One third of the time, uh, the round would be over because the host opens the door with the grand prize and that's it, wah, wah, it's over. So your odds of winning were originally one in three. They got now go to one in two and it doesn't matter mathematically if you switch or not. However, psychologically, because we're human, you're probably better off to stick with your original choice. And the reason for that is you stick with door number one and it turns out to be door number two that you could have switched to, you'll forgive yourself because you will tell yourself you didn't know better. You couldn't possibly have known better. However, if you switch to door number two and it's actually in behind door number one, which you originally chose, you will beat yourself up because you will tell yourself that you knew where, this, where the prize was. You didn't, but you'll still beat yourself up for it. Okay, so rule set B. Here, the host is giving you very valuable information. You should use it. Again, this is the, the scenario that most people on the internet and in life uh, say. You originally had a one in three chance that you chose the door with the grand prize, correct? And there was a two in three chance that you could be wrong. So prior to the host opening the, uh, an extra door, and remember, he will always open a door that has nothing behind it. That two and three chance that was split between two doors is now a two and three chance split, or not split, it's just all bound up in that one door. So you had a one in, one in three chance of getting the door when you originally chose, that hasn't changed, but it has changed that your two and three chance of being wrong has gone from two and three chance split between two doors to a two and three chance uh, of it being behind one door. So play the odds and switch. Rule set C, this is the evil Monty Hall one. So under these rules, you will only get a choice to switch if you have already chosen the door with the grand prize. Remember, Monty would open the door if it was available for him to choose just to end the round and make sure you don't get the prize. So in this one, two out of three times, the host would have ended the round by opening the door. Wah, wah, sound effect, round over, you get laughed at. So under this scenario, by giving you a choice, the host has basically given you the best information out of all scenarios. The host has to basically told you that you have chosen the door with the grand prize. Don't change your choice. So how do you decide? We have three valid hypotheses. You can argue whether one is more realistic than the other, but we can solve it one of two ways or both, tying back to what we did originally. First, we you can use deductive reasoning. You can go on the website, see what the rules are, go to interviews and see if anyone's giving away how they make these choices. <coughs> or second, you can use inductive reasoning, gather up as many instances of this game segment as possible and analyze the data. <clears throat> so we have three hypotheses. 
We want to gather data to find out which one it is, test all three hypotheses. The data we would like to gather is how often the door that the host opens reveals the grand prize. If rule set A applies, and if it all, uh, again, this is assuming one rule set applies all of the time, if rule set A applies, one third of the time, the host will reveal the grand prize and you get the wah-wah sound effect. One third of the time, it's over that way. If rule set B applies, the host will never reveal the grand prize. You will always get a choice. And if rule set C applies, two thirds of the time, the host will reveal the grand prize and you get the wah-wah sound effect. So one third, never two thirds. We have data that would support making a decision on uh, one rule set or the other. Okay. And I think this truly is the grand prize because now we've set ourselves up for a good conversation to have with people. Uh, we've talked about how we can gather information and learn more about the world. And that's what the winning is all about. There. Questions? I am done. Uh -huh. Donna, you have a question or just clapping? <laughs> <laughs> I hope people got something out of that. I was never oh, yeah. sure of the, the amount of the right level of information. Stephen. That uh, second World War bomber is one thing that I'm really interested in. Um, where the planes got hit. And I think the problem there is the sample. So normally in statistics, we're talking about random sampling. But in that particular case, it actually wasn't a random sample because the sample of those planes were actually the one that returned. So the one that did not return were not in the sample. Right. So really, really what we are talking is, let's say there were 100 planes that went out uh, and the, 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 uh, the wing has 100 planes and through the many bombing missions, about 60% of them survived. So the random, the sample should be actually looking at the 40% that haven't survived, have not survived, and that's where they got hit. But actually, because they crashed, they got hit, they got shot down. So you don't have that sample there at all. So right. what you ended up is the sample of the planes that all came back, which was the opposite. That was a very biased sample. Right. That was the example of survivorship bias there. You are absolutely right, Stephen. And are you taking us way down a rabbit hole? Are you part of this cabal? <laughs> uh, I'm not taking you down a rabbit okay. hole. But, All right. But, so, yes, but that's a perfect example of the good data is a very difficult to come by. So you make compromises. We do that in all of the time. You could have sent those people into Germany where the planes got shot down and investigate the crash sites to mm -hmm. see where they are. That's probably not going to work. <laughs> no, no, the place probably all got burned and you cannot, when it crashed, exploded, right. you, you can never really find it. So the, the right way was actually looking at the planes that yeah. came back and look at the opposite part of the plane. Right, which that is wasn't exactly hit. That's yeah. how you get the other 40% sample. Yeah, but that's, that's actually part of what uh, Andrew Wald actually did. Mm -hmm. And I didn't add this in there. He died in a plane crash about 1952. So he told mm -hmm. us all about the uh, survivorship bias and he did not live long. So. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. That kind of anyway. makes you wonder. Sorry, Vincent, go ahead. That it kind of makes you wonder. That's all. No question. <laughs> if and I'm highly selective because... about the data I present to you, I can make any story seem real, right? That's what That's conspiracy true. theories are all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But my point, uh, my point is, if the conspiracy theory actually serves you, 
run with it for a while, huh? You know, it's not your fault that, uh, you know, you glazed over in high school, the probability and statistics or blah, blah, blah. Not your fault, okay? Now is your opportunity to, to stick it to the man and, and learn about this and not fall victim to the casinos again. Hmm. Well, but you could use... <laughs> so my favorite game of gambling is craps because it does go by probability but you go into it knowing that it's fixed. Yep. You know, you're still based on probability. You still have a higher chance of this or that, but yep. you know that the casino in, you know, a thousand rolls is going to be ahead, but, right. but I yeah. have been ahead. So. Excellent. <laughs> you know what? That's a, that's a perfect example to talk about here because what these things, what these tools do, don't tell you what you should do. It doesn't say what your risk tolerance should be. It helps inform your risk tolerance to see if you are really comfortable with the way the math comes out. And if you're comfortable playing craps because you, you win often enough and you're excited by it, it's something to do, whatever your reasons, as long as you're making an informed choice on that, that's perfectly fine. Stats can serve its purpose there. You, you should not be I would suggest you should not be ignorant of the odds when you're gambling money, but winning, you know, coming out ahead is not the only criteria. And that's fine for you to say that. This should inform it. It shouldn't dictate it or overrule it. Have you ever tried that game? I think I have a highly addictive personality. I got into video games and over and over again, I had to win and I had to crush the game, not just win the game, crush it. So anytime I saw, uh, you know, VLT machines or something, I'm kind of going, I remember you, you know, you and your eight bit graphics, you are, you are death to me, stay away. So I tried desperately to avoid that. I don't know what that is, VLT? A video, video lottery term. So you can play uh, Kino or poker or whatever on uh, uh, basically a, an arcade machine in the bars or something. So I have a story that is interesting about mathematicians. It was just about a little more than 200 years ago in primary school, which I assume is first, second, third grade. The teacher got very upset at the students' bad behavior. And to punish them, the teacher said they had to sit there and add up all the numbers from one to a hundred. And so almost all the students were just sitting there writing and writing and adding and working, except one. And he was kind of looking out the window thinking. And when the teacher said, everybody ready? She asked for the answers. The only one that got it right was the little boy staring out the window. He said, well, that, the answer is 5,050. The students looked, and the teacher said, uh, how did you decide that? And he said, well, 90, 100 plus 1 is 101. 99 plus 2 is 101. 97 plus 3 is, oh, plus, anyway, but 4 yeah. is 101. He said, there's 50 pairs of 101, so it's got to be 5,050. <laughs> this is primary school. <laughs> yep. The name of that student was Carl Friedrich Gauss. <laughs> of the My Gauss. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was an amazing story anyway. Thank you, Lois. Stephen. Uh, I just don't want to be... Uh up here, nobody else raised hand, so I have an interesting question for all of you. If we go to a uh, meeting and there were people in the room, and you talk to the people there, how many people, how many need to be there so that two person will have the same birthday? How large a sample do you need? Okay, Gavin, how many? Does anyone else want to jump in? Anybody else want to try this one? 365? No, it's actually not very large. 26. It's, yeah, it's very close. 
Yeah, it is about 23, 24. Okay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> you know why? Now, any day, so it is two, two people have the same birthday. So any day of the year. So the chance of two people have the same birthday is one over 365, right? The chance of not two people have the same birthday, the negative side is 364 over 365, okay? Now, if you do that, and so the chance of how many people, so 364 over 365 raised to the power of N, that's the number of people in your room. So if you raise that to 23, so that is the chance of none of two of them have the same birthday. And so it's one minus 364 over 365 raised to the N power. And the N is about 23. When you do that, then the chance there is better than 0 0.5. It's five, five, one something there. So actually you don't need a lot of people in the same room to run into two of them have exactly the same birthday. That's fascinating. Fun with stats. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, it, it's all, we, we all think that you need a lot of people, but I, I run into a situation like in a convention, not a very large one. And then guess what? Somebody say, hey, so-and-so have the same birthday as me. And they look in the room, it's like, well, there were only 40 people there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. If you uh, if you look at the things uh, like this, you'll find out there's lot there's lots of things in this world that are more common than we would uh, than our gut would tell us, uh -huh. and there's many things less common than what our gut would tell us. Now, my personal theory is we as humans developed math because we wanted to explain something that our guts could not tell us. Like we have a very narrow range that. Well, it is our lived experience that our guts are good for, but there's so much of this world that is outside that very narrow range that you want to be able to describe, and math is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. It also yes. lets you go forward and backward in time, run things over and over and over again for the, the cheap price of electricity to run your laptop. So <laughs> take advantage of it. Life's tough enough. <laughs> Well, that that's remind. Oh, Bob, you have your hand up. Yeah, just an example of, of of your sampling thing. I, I many years ago, I was unemployed for a while, and I decided to go to the racetrack, which I had never gone to before. And the, for the first week, I went and nothing else to do. I, I they have these people that that will say what they think is going to happen that you can purchase or give give for free. I think it was for free. And so I, I for the first week, I, I did. I just I did. What I thought was deductive reasoning. I'm I'm looking at everything that they're saying, what they think is going to happen, and then I look at the actually what happened, and I came up with a with a what I thought was the pattern. And so the second week I started using that to bet, and I started out with two dollars, and by the end of the week I had a thousand dollars because I kept rolling it over, and and then very because I was now betting large amounts because the whole thing, I very quickly went back down to zero, and. Later on, I went and, and, and looked at, at these sheets that they put out for like a cut for like three months worth. And it turned out that the system I came up with for the one month, one week sample was totally non existent. If you looked at the three months worth, I simply, in that particular little short thing, found a pattern that did not prevail. Excellent example. And we've had a couple gambling. Uh... Uh, examples brought up right now, and I wanted to, to bring up another example of survivorship bias. There are people that are professional gamblers, and if you talk to them, apparently, there an inordinate number of them were lucky when they started out. Their first few bets, they were very lucky in it, and they survived, and they got the, uh, the belief that they were lucky, <laughs> and so they kept doing it. This goes into other things as well, like Warren Buffett has enough humility to say that, you know, he bet on various uh, uh, investments and it turned out well enough, like he survived, 
that it might just be dumb luck that he became as successful as he did because he was able to survive long enough, <laughs> which I think is fascinating that uh, that's the collision of math and the, the real world and human psychology in that. So anyway. Our, our gut doesn't tell us a lot of real things about math because, well, I don't know why. <laughs> There, there's the, the other, well, the story that everybody's probably heard, but about the, the uh, who was it that invented chess? It was a court jester or somebody, the king's court jester, invented chess. And the, the king was thrilled. He loved the game. And he, he wanted, he calls the guy and he says, okay, I, you know, I want to thank you. I want to reward you for, you know, creating this fabulous game. He says, what do you want? So the guy thought for a minute and he said, okay, he says, just wheat to live on. He says, put one piece of wheat in the first square on the board and double that, put two on the second and double it every time and fill up the chessboard. And the king says, really, that's all you want? And he's, yep. Yeah. Well, it turns out that that was more wheat than the country produced. <laughs> because we we don't yeah. think exponentially. That's right. We, we think Things go to the power sixty four. <laughs> you don't think? Yeah. Uh huh. And I think I think the guy was beheaded or something. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but I, that's just it shows how we just don't comprehend the way math really works, and we just have to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exponentially is how I got from two dollars to a thousand dollars in one week. You don't think you're going to do it, but it, yeah. I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, Stephen. Well, I, I hate to raise my hand again, again but uh, I was looking for somebody else raising their hand. Maybe <laughs> just I don't want to. This is a uh, basic uh, Gavin's uh, show, so I just don't want to. Uh, keep jumping up and down. But I, I have one very part. interesting... Hmm? I did my part. You did your Fun part. with okay. it. Where do we go from okay. here? I, I have a very interesting experience at school. It's about the normal distribution curve. So, um, Lois, if you don't mind, I'm going to share screen and oh. show something. So I'll I have, have to... Uh, I, I will have to... I I think I, because I did my previous presentation, I have okay, to share yeah. screen thing already. You're set up now. Yeah, I'm set up. Okay. So I'm going to show you something and share. Okay. Everybody see this one? Yep. Mm -hmm. So this is my email to the class after the final exam. Okay. So the class has 33 students. And this is the operations management class, one of the fourth year class, which is a mandatory course for all the uh, business school students. So a little bit of information about this is because it's a mandatory course. So whether the student really like it or not, uh, you have to take it. So we have accounting student, finance student, marketing, human resource entrepreneur. It's a real mix back there in the 33, the 33 students there. And if you look at final exam grade right now. So I told the class, okay, the highest is 89. It's one body, somebody got 89. It's an A. The average of the class is 65.28 and the median is 67.33. Now, if you don't look at the grade distribution, if I were to just tell you the highest is 89. Now I did not tell them the lowest because one of the students who flunked badly, I think he got 38. So the highest is 89, the lowest is 38, the average is this, the median is this. It looks like a normal distribution, right? But the truth is it is not. It's not a normal distribution. And uh, I just, for fun, I draw it, so I'm going to show you, um, if you can see, mm -hmm. this is what it's like, really, okay? Wow. So, the orange are the one at the A's and the B's, 
the black are the ones at the, at the D and the F. Really, oh. in the middle, there is the red, which is supposed to be normal distribution. <laughs> okay, so this is really what the graph looks like. And I don't know what the <coughs> graph is, it's a bipolar graph from the class. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is a bipolar, bipolar graph. Mm -hmm. Now, I have the, every semester I have a report to the chair, how the class did, well, the average is 60, 67, so it's a C minus, the lowest is 39, and the highest is 89. Very normal, acceptable. But the real <laughs> story is not, it is not. What really happened? How come half the class, about 14 of them, or 15 of them did very well, the other 14 did very poorly, and only four of them are in the middle in the C where the median is. Guess what? So I look up at the background, what major they are in. Ah. Ha ha, that tells the story. The one in the A's and the B's are the accounting students, the finance student, and the supply chain management student, who are usually very good at math because that course involves mathematical modeling, optimization, and things like that. Those guys know. And it affects their future job because accounting students, they need to probably when they go to a company, let's say an oil company, and out in the field, well, how is their efficiency? What is the capacity management? What is the forecasting model? Well, these guys will be interested in them. The supply chain student, obviously, is operations management. They will be interested in it. The other half, they were the marketing students, the human resource students. <laughs> 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 they have no interest in this. So it tells me something. And one day, I'm really going to go and talk to the chair. It's about this course. It's mandatory. But unfortunately, one half of them was just dragging along. Basically, he said, well, give me a pass. Just get this over with, okay? <laughs> and that's really what we should do is don't, don't make this course a mandatory. And make it so that for the, for the uh, human resource and the marketing, give them another course so that they understand the operations of the company, but don't force them to all do all these things calculations and math modeling and efficiency calculation just do it in another course rather than who everybody into this 40th course and make it mandatory so that is something from like the um, sampling and statistics and curve that actually tell you something that really will happen so that's a great example of don't force reality to bend to a model Mo no, right. reality doesn't owe you anything there nope. so yeah reality is not so that was a, a great example of yep bye vincent uh, that's a great example of uh you know the normal distribution assumes that it's random about a median yep but you've you've done exactly right it is not normal about to mean you're evenly distributed about a median there is very good reason why your class is uh bimodal like that it's a, it's an aptitude and those with not yeah. so so that's a, a perfect example but that's one of the things that stats is good at is that you've confirmed what you mm -hmm. actually did do is that there should be a normal distribution about that c grade Mm -hmm. And the fact that there isn't means that something is wrong and you should do something about that because if you're in trying to teach a class, you are teaching uh -huh. to the average <laughs> and that's not working. You're exactly no right. there. You, should be, you should be like, there should be a different stats course for, for those in marketing that exactly. yeah. goes slower yeah. or is, it, it teaches it a different way. Uh, exactly. So that's still the value of stats, even though the model didn't fit it. And it's valuable yeah. because the model didn't fit it. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Stephen. Perfect example. Uh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> okay. David. So uh, a bimodal distribution is an example in uh, Stephen Jay Gould's The Mismeasure Ooh. of Man, ah. where wow. he talks about um, immigration into the U.S. Sorry, Lois and Bob, can I pick on the Americans this time again? Um, <laughs> 
where they, they uh, at one time administered an intelligence test to people who arrived at Ellis Island or wherever. And uh, they concluded that Jewish immigrants from Europe were all dumb because they got zero. And if you looked at the distribution of scores, it was a bimodal distribution. There was a bunch of people, uh, more or less a normal distribution, and there's a whole bunch way down low because the test was in English and they didn't speak oh. English. <laughs> oh, no. So anyway, that was their conclusion. Um, but I, I was uh, uh, amused too, uh, Stephen. So for, like like Lois, I'm interested in, in many things. So while I was doing my... PhD in chemistry with my courses in physics and so on, I did graduate courses in finance. Uh -huh. So the, the first graduate course in finance I did was with the MBA students, the, the you know, master's of business. And um, I was also TAing in, in chemistry at the time. So I was used to looking at, at uh, good line fits through data, sometimes noisy data. And uh, anyway, it was a presentation with these MBA students on the return of stock, you know, stock market returns after some event, or I forget what it was, but it was pretty noisy, pretty noisy data, like a, a lot of social science data is noisy, isn't it, Lois? No. We won't be mean to the social science people. Anyway, so they had this noisy data and they had a straight line drawn through it. Um, and they had a report of the line and its slope and intercept. And I looked at it. And what they had drawn was not the best fit to it. Um, and the slope of the line they had drawn was the opposite sign to what they reported. So I, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a seminar thing. And so, okay, here's the, here's the science, you know, physical science guy <laughs> um, saying, so how did you draw that line? Well, we just took a ruler and drew it. I said, but the line you're reporting is a different line. Yeah, well, that's what the statistical analysis package gave us. It says you, you drew a different line through the data than your package told you to draw. Anyway, <laughs> the, the professor got the point. A lot of the students got the point. I, I don't know if, if, if they did, but, you know, yeah. really drawing a line, a different line than you're reporting. Really, guys? Oh, you know, good. oh, man. What, what's the most uh, frequent mistake when people are trying to draw a line of best fit by eyeballing it. I don't know. It's almost always they assume zero, zero is a point. Oh. And it can, you can really, you know, throw yourself off. So, well, when I was working writing textbooks, this was something we had to emphasize. Don't assume that it goes through the origin. Yeah. Well, that's the point of the intercept. So I don't think my students, I don't remember my students, but you know, they, somebody could have, and I wouldn't necessarily remember all my students over the, yeah. over the, over the years since 1976. Uh, <laughs> well, it's just another, another way of saying, you know, make sure you have the right assumptions. So the most common error that I remember from my students, they were, they were, this, I don't remember which, which field it was in, Chemistry or physics, one of those two. Um, they um, were measuring a, a, oh yeah, it was chemistry. The rate of reaction, they're measuring rate of reaction. And uh, so they're plotting the rate of reaction versus the inverse of the temperature or something. And they had measured the temperature in Celsius and took the <laughs> inverse in Celsius instead of in oh, Kelvin. Oh. And so oh. I asked them some critical question Really? What if you'd done this in Fahrenheit instead? And so they just recalculated in Fahrenheit. <laughs> I'm too subtle. I'm too subtle. Oh, no. oh. So I saw that more than once. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, the importance of visualizing your data. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, do, it doesn't make a straight line when you have a lot of Celsius. Or, it's really bad. <laughs> right. Yes. And you get, you know, a terrifically wrong answer. Mm -hmm. um, But we did have, I did have this one, one course that I was the TA on where the people who measured, did the measurements the best got a curve, 
but they were told to fit a straight line to it. Hmm. And so they did. And so the people who got, did the measurement the best actually got the worst, got an answer that disagreed with the, the standard answer because it wasn't a straight line. And, and, and there was, it was a, it was an interesting, that was all interesting field, Langmuir isotherms for those who possibly care, which is probably, well, maybe lowest, but probably otherwise not. Be. Anyways, to do with adsorption of charcoal, of, of chemical, of, of, of onto charcoal. And if, as the concentration rises, it changes from a mono layer to a bilayer and so on. Mm. And you could you could pick that up. And some students were so good, you could actually pick that up from the data. Which I think wow. Was, yeah. We, we would try to teach our students to find, to do things with their data to, to try to make a straight line, like square one of the pieces of data and, you know, take the log of another or do something and, and work it around until they got a straight line, that a really good straight line, and then come up mm. with their equation for the line. That was fun. Oh, that was really fun. Yeah. Yeah, we... we those uh, in the forecasting thing like the uh, the least square regression trying mm -hmm. to fit the line uh, the, the least between all those dotted line for the forecast into the future mm -hmm. yes i spent a lot of time fitting mm -hmm. data that was most of my most of my eight years as a grad student was mm -hmm. fitting data and trying to assess the statistical likelihood of of the result Wow. It was, uh, uh, one of my first work terms, I was uh, uh, what's called what, aquifer mining. I was doing some research on that for uh, a, a, a company I worked for. So they asked, you know, here's the data of all the water wells drilled over the last 70 years, whatever. And here's their, here's how far below the ground surface the the water was and here's the you know your topographic map so you can find out the elevation so where what how is the aquifer going down with time and i came back with an answer of you know it's like 0 0.0000037 meters per year and they go oh well that's nothing and you kind of go, oh, okay well or meters per day or whatever it was <laughs> and it was just kind of like oh i'm sorry i, I didn't uh, do this right you should you know, see the plot over time and it definitely is a downward trend because you know units don't actually translate to people understanding you know so anyways well that's, the that's Mars really interesting uh, work in, in the world now we, we have uh, some huge problems uh, Arizona for example is having a huge mm. problem where they are mining ancient water Oh, mm -hmm. and uh, they're going to, they're all going to die. <laughs> well, mining ancients, main, mining ancients water, wouldn't that actually cause actually uh, the cave in and ground subsidence and, is, is a byproduct yeah, of that. Subsiding and, and you got big, big holes all of a sudden the cave in and you got these big, big holes. Uh, yeah, the or, or the whole thing can just subside slowly. Uh -huh. uh, Houston. When I used to live in Houston for my sins uh, and and they mine the groundwater there and so all of Houston is slowly sinking did you see uh -huh. some floods a couple of years ago there yeah well the, the ground is closer to sea level than it used to be because mm. every little district in Houston and Houston is made up of of hundreds of of little districts in the city and, and each little water districts and each one was is sucking water out of out of the ground uh, yeah. also the Mekong Delta is uh -huh. is subsiding and mm -hmm. uh, the, the, if, if you dig a hole in the Mekong Delta, the water table is very close to the surface. Mm. And they're, they're sucking the fresh water out and it's slowly going down. And the sea level is rising for climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So well, another city actually in Indonesia, isn't the whole uh, Jakarta is sinking right now? Yes. Yes. Again. Yeah. 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 Jakarta, the because they're yeah. basically moving out. The capital is moving out. They're moving the capital to some other place where they can possibly yeah. repeat the error. Hopefully, they'll be smarter the second time mm -hmm. around uh, and not do that. But because it's not reversible, if yeah. you stop the the, the 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 nature of clays. So, my putting my geology hat on. Uh, <laughs> uh, the you suck the water out of the clay; it doesn't go back in. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Uh, may not right. go back. It depends on the type of soil right. it is, but a lot of the clays, that's it. They're done. You know, give me a million years. I'll, I'll come back. But uh, it's, uh, they, they were formed with that water in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. And so then when you suck it out, it's, it's now a, a nice rock. Yeah. Wow. Mexico City is going like that as well. Like it's subsided 20 feet last I heard. Like the water wells, their their casings are way up in the air. You have to cut the water well off to get oh, access well. to it again. Well, it's not going to have trouble with the ocean because it's very it's a very yeah. high altitude place, but they will Ooh. run out of fresh water. It's an ancient lake bed. That's why earthquakes are so bad there because Ooh. it's all clay. They're sitting on a bed of clay. Now the clay is drying out, so maybe it'll be less of a problem in the future, but there'll be no water to... Uh, anyway, so when, when, when there's an earthquake, everything shakes much more because there's no bedrock there. Ooh. It's all clay, wow. deep clay. Okay. Yeah. But, but that the thing about using resources that are non-renewable is something human beings have done forever. And what we've done before is we just move on to a different area and... Ooh. I, I look at right now uh, what's happening in Toronto and which is by a great big, I gather is by a great big freshwater lake and it's the place that's going to get warmer over time and maybe that's why a lot of people are moving there. Oh. Hmm. But, but the... Uh, you think people plan plan ahead on the climate change? I think... Uh, <laughs> they haven't planned ahead on anything else to do with climate change. Well, people that are very rich that are multi-generational rich, they've learned to look ahead. And maybe they're looking for where they want their descendants to be. Wow. So when I moved to Calgary, I knew that it was that Calgary was going to run out of water and that I had to move at some point. Yeah. It's just running out a little faster than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, or yeah. I didn't, didn't uh, do the calculations I, um, fully, but that's that's the thing. I'm, I'm talking about we're talking about moving away, and I know that Calgary is going to, and not just Calgary, but the surrounding area is going to run out of water. It's, it's, we know it's going to happen. It's a certainty. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do about it. So now what? Yeah. We, we I used to live in Toronto people. as well. Um, so, I lived in Toronto for more than 20 years back then. And I did a very unscientific statistic calculation about the temperature and humidity in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So I was in Toronto back in 1975. That's when I left Michigan and moved to Toronto. So I know the summer was hot, but the day, so if eventually about 1979, I bought my first house. I was quick because there was uh, the government incentive, uh, mm. registered house, whatever thing. And I put money into it. I managed to put a down payment. And the house came with central air, which was, I thought, wow, Toronto, they have central air. And I realized that, well, I actually have to set, start the central air sometime after the first week of, or the second week of June. And I can turn it off pretty safely by the Labor Day weekend. By the time I left Toronto in about 1998, Okay, the last summer I was there, the central air has to be on long before Victoria Day weekend. So the second week of May. Right. And I can't send off, turn off the central air until at least the third week of September. So you know the normal curve, the... Um, uh, the, the uh, standard var vari variance has actually expanded. So the curve, instead of very sharp, somewhere on July the 1st, is both sides spread towards May and September because Toronto is actually getting warmer and more humid. Right. Mm. <clears throat> but, uh, part of Europe might get colder. Yes. With, because with the melting of the ice caps and that the effect on the northern uh, mm -hmm. i can't Both say it, atlantic ocean it's possible you know it's diluting it it changes the temperature it's possible that the uh, gulf stream could uh, stop running yep. and it's the gulf stream that is keeping europe as warm as it is carrying you know, the, the heat from the Gulf and around there 
up to mm-hmm. Europe. And that, that it just seems weird, you know, because tell, tell somebody that global warming is going to make Europe colder. <laughs> no. No, <laughs> and, so and, calling it global climate change makes, makes more that's sense. That's right, yeah. The Stockholm, <clears throat> Stockholm is the same latitude as Juneau, Alaska. And you can wow. grow stuff in Sweden that you can't grow in Alaska. Yeah. Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. Right, yeah. Well, isn't Calgary about the same as London? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and London is much warmer. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I came up with an interesting theory recently. I don't know if it's true, but it was like, why are there a large number of pale-skinned people in the world? And my theory was that um, to get pale-skinned people, you have to have people living uh, in the in the, more toward the poles. Yeah, and then number two, to get a large number of them, the climate in that area has to be viable for human, a large number of human beings. And I blamed it on the Gulf Stream. Basically, the Gulf Stream made Northern Europe some a place that was close to the pole and also a place where you could grow things and live and whatever. And therefore, you ended up with a large number of pale, pale-skinned people. Hmm. That was hmm. my theory. I thought, well, that, maybe that fits uh, compared to other areas where there, it's close to the poles, but the climate just isn't as good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You could get large numbers of them growing there, growing mm-hmm. people, in effect. Or maybe, yeah. maybe the pale skin people killed off all the non pale skin. <laughs> well, no, you have to be pale skinned to get your vitamin D and be healthy if you're toward the poles, because that's where you get your vitamin D before we had vitamin D pills. And, and I, I read one time that, like, um, somebody in Sweden who was pale skin versus not pale skin. The, the viability was like an extra 10%. Hmm. Uh, uh, and just a 1% difference in viability of a particular gene will very quickly cause that gene to be very widespread. So a 10%, so, you know, having blonde hair and blue eyes and pale skin, blonde hair say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the 10%, go for me, uh, as far as uh, breeding selection, made some sense. Mm-hmm. It is true that, that uh, <clears throat> as humans moved further north and needed more vitamin C or that that is the main thing that caused the lighter skin. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it's very valu- valuable for health is what we found. Yeah. And so therefore. Why are there more blonde people? Aren't, isn't that a very small um, percentage? Mm-hmm. But it's the skin mainly. You know, the, skin, that, uh, you know, the blonde, absorbs- blonde hair is just a signal to be, you know, I have, I have white skin. Okay. David? Um, I remember the thing I was actually going to talk about when I got all excited about what Stephen was, was saying. So, so uh, exponentials and compound interest. So I, one of my not secret uh, pastimes is watching Antiques Roadshow for entertainment. And you'll see people getting the price, an estimated price by an expert evaluator and and there's a price it was purchased by their grandparents or, or whatever. And the new price is frequently a whole lot more. But I typically work out the percent for, for, for things that are uh, like that, the percentage increase per year. And it's typically around 5%. Mm-hmm. So the, the new price, oh, it's a lot of money compared to the old price. Yeah. They were rich when they bought it. <laughs> and uh, you're rich now because you still own it. But it was only five percent, and five percent compounded is 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 terrific. That's a doubling time of fourteen years. So wow. after one hundred forty years, you get ten doublings. That's a thousand thousand mm-hmm. times what it was that it was that it was bought for. It's just that at the time it was bought, that that dollar was worth a lot more mm-hmm. than, yeah. than it is today. Yeah, yeah. So I have... people people don't grasp compound interest. Oh yeah, everybody uh, here knew. Um, let's see, what was the Oh, thinking of exponential growth. If you take one bacterium, but uh, <laughs> I don't remember how many micrograms or <laughs> nanograms, whatever, and <clears throat> and you provide it with the maximum uh, nutrients, <laughs> and you get a bacterium that doubles in twenty minutes, and some of them do. I mean, that's that's typical. How long would it take 
okay, assuming that you could provide the nutrients, which you can't, but assuming that the nutrients were available, how long would it take before the one bacterium had them uh, grew into a the size of the mass of the earth? And how often is it you're doubling? 20 minutes. And how big is it to start with? Well, I can't remember, but it's something like micrograms or nanograms. Yeah. Gotcha. It's, it's, okay. less than a, it's less than a picogram. If it's, a 50, it if, if, if it's 50 microns, which I'm, you know, some, some cells are smaller, some cells are yeah. larger, but 50 is a nice, easy number to work with. Then it's going to be something like a, an eighth of, of a picogram. Mm -hmm. I just I just worked it up very quickly, so I might be off by a factor of 10 to the ninth or something. But that doesn't make, that doesn't make too much difference. <laughs> it, it's something like two and a half days. Wow. Oh, Close your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, tells you to make sure you when you clean your hands you you really clean your hands. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> the fate of the world uh, is, it depends on you washing your hands. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, oh, that's fun. Well, it's it's, fun. numbers are fun. Yeah, I am so impressed to have such a good conversation about math and stats and all of these things. So thank you very much. It warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I can see you put a lot of time into it, especially rolling all those dice 20 times and doing marbles. Well, I, I need to know. The people want to know, right? Absolutely. Well, yeah. So that's, yeah. that's dedication. That's, yeah, that's dedication. I hope people got something out of it. There seemed to be a lot of smart people here that I, uh, yeah, it was one of the things of you, you got to know your audience when you talk, and I am not so sure. So. Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully people enjoy it. Well, we're going to get a lot of uh, views on YouTube also. Uh, I'm sure. So. So, and, and my big contribution, I think, is to the Monty Hall problem. So, you know, yes. I, I think that there is, it is a viable option to think there is an evil Monty Hall out there. So, <laughs> right. By the way, and, on, the Monty, on the Monty Hall, when they did... Did, looked at all the all the different sessions. What did they find out? Well, Monty Hall actually jumped in because the "Let's Make a Deal" was on the air when this when this problem came out, uh -huh. and he said, "My show, my rules. You don't get to play this way. You make your choice, and you don't get to change." So it's kind of a it's it's a made up problem. So oh, I see. Gotcha. So. I suggest to go get data for that. You can't go back to the old uh, let's make a deal shows and see what that is because apparently that's not the way it worked. Uh, okay. Oh, but I like the idea of going out and gathering data because, you know, yes. that's fun. Safari, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Put yeah. that on, go out and, uh, you know, get some friends. You're, you're watching stuff. This is, oh, yeah, no yeah. better time. Okay, well, let's let's have Stephen and his last 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 thing last one. Last, yeah, last last one, and we are going to leave soon as well. It's very last one because we are talking about the Monty Hall thing, and I thought of something. Some years ago, I I was in, I went to Vancouver, and we got we uh, stay at Richmond, so there was a casino there, it's the Riverfront Casino. It's ran by First Nation. And it's a very interesting casino because it's a big one and it has a big restaurant and because of the Asian population in Richmond, actually, you can have your dim sum in that restaurant as well. So I went there, my friend took me there and you have to have a membership card to get in. But if you want to get in, they will issue a membership card to you right away at the door anyway. So you can go in and they give you a membership card and you use the membership card to swipe the machine. Now, that is actually something there. I realized because I was the first timer there. Okay. So I said to my friend, okay, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not a gambler. I'm going willing to put $20 there. If I lose it, I lose it. But because I'm the first timer, they also gave me $20 of chips as well. Mm -hmm. So I started with 40 mm -hmm. and I stick with the slot machine. Okay. The slot machine. Now, guess what? After about 45 minutes, 
I actually had about two hundred dollars. Mm. I won. So I said to my friend, "I hit two fifty. Let's quit." I'm, I I had a fishy feeling because I'm the first timer here, and it seems too easy that with the forty dollars I could win two hundred and fifty in less than one hour. Let's go. Go to the counter, to the cage, cash out, and leave. I think I was right because a few months later I went back. I have the same card, and I said again, twenty dollars, no more. And guess what? I lost my twenty dollars within the first maybe ten minutes. And I said, that's it. I lost. I go. So I don't think the slot machine. Because it's electronic slot machine,、mm -hmm. it is really they target you.、Mm -hmm. With that card, I swipe in. They know I am the first time there. They want to suck me in. Ah. Okay. okay? <laughs> so it's not me. It so it 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 is like uh, uh, the multi hole thing. Okay. The 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 host, which is the gambling house, the Riverside. Gambling casino, because、mm -hmm. they want to suck you in. Right. Has anybody else have such experience in the casino? Yeah. What I usually do when I go to Las Vegas and they give you some free chips, I、uh -huh. would say, "Fine, I'll take this over. I'll play the roulette wheel, red and black, where you've、uh -huh. got almost fifty percent chance. Yeah. Which means I'm going to get my money,、uh, and I just divide it up into a, several bets, and 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 I get." I get the money they gave me in effect back uh -huh. Uh -huh. because on average you're gonna you you get you get it. So I just yeah. did it that way. Yeah, that's not、I、fun this... though. How where's the fun in that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know because I, I stick with the slot machine because I had the funny suspicions. Those are all、um, the screen. Electronic screen. So the old slot machine, you have the one arm bandit. This new one, you know, you push buttons.、Mm -hmm. So basically, you can control it. Really, I think they do have a computer con program that control when you swipe the card, and they know who you are.、Mm, yeah, I wasn't. Was I was there? The conspiracy that, theory. <laughs> on me was you can't just take what they give you and immediately cash it in. You have to.、Uh -huh. Launder the money. Oh, you have to play. Oh, I see. The, so I would、yep. launder it through the roulette wheel. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. I see. There's money yeah. laundering. Yeah. 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 You have to launder the money first.、Yep. Yes. So similar, similar to gambling, but different. I I was a pro or given a phone call a number of years ago about、uh, you know Atco or whoever is selling me natural gas.、Hmm. They wanted to know did I want to be on the fixed rate program because I was on the、hmm. variable rate. Mm -hmm. And I worked for the energy regulator at a time, so it's the regulated rate where they get a certain amount of money. Now, the the person is telling me and and telling me all of the the great benefits of being on the fixed rate. And I told her, I am one person. You are asking me to place a bet on <laughs> gas being this price on average for the year. You、mm -hmm. have entire rooms of people calculating that out and playing the odds. And、yeah. <laughs> determine <laughs> when you're comfortable selling me that gas at a price that you're going to make more money than me on the regulated rate. Right. And I think I had her convinced afterwards that this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'm not smarter than your room full of people. No. So you know, I'm not taking your bet. Thank you. Well, that that's like oh, that's buying、uh, um, maintenance insurance on your car. Mm -hmm. They have it figured out. Any insurance, they've got to figure it out, so they're going to make a make、mm -hmm. something off of it.、Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah.、Mm -hmm. Or annuity tables, I guess. Yeah, annuity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.、Uh, okay, and、uh, I'm going、uh, yeah, to leave. Great、yeah. evening. Well, I think it's time for us to to all shut down. And、uh, glad you all came. And Remember the the video will be up. I don't know. I have to figure out how to handle that break in between when it started and stopped, but I'll figure that out. And、okay. it'll be up on the our ASC YouTube channel pretty soon,、uh, mm -hmm. as soon as I figure that out.
And See if you you can edit them together. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to, uh, but I haven't done that before. But I'll figure it out. Okay. So, okay. Uh, okay. Thanks for coming, and good, if you need good. a second round, it'll be there. Okay. Good to see you all. Good night. 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 Good night.